Well, this first Sunday in Advent is attempting to remain on this theme of transition that Pastor Chris and I have been fiddling with. I imagine there is nothing so transitional as coming to Christ and walking with him on into the future. There are great promises that the scriptures make to us. So this morning I want to talk about promises. There's probably not a more misused word than promise in the English language. There's a skin cream that promises that in 10 days it will take the bags out from under your eyes. It doesn't work. And then there's always the promise that this pill will lower your cholesterol by a million points by the end of the week. There's a promise that if you buy gold in three years, your investment will go up 138%. I don't know about that. I don't have any gold. And then there's margarine that promises that your cholesterol will immediately come down and you'll live to be 200. So all of those promises, it becomes quite absurd. The word becomes sort of meaningless. It's found in the dictionary as a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. It's from a Latin word, promettere, which means to move something forward, which is interesting. Well, what kind of promises does God make? It is amazing to contemplate the promises that he has made in the word of God. As one who used to be an atheist, I still marvel at reading the promises God has made and then occasionally reflecting upon seeing them fulfilled. The Bible is literally filled with future statements. For example, we'll see this morning, you will be with child, the angel said to Mary, and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, and he will be great and will be the Son of God, call the Son of God the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. That's just marvelous to contemplate. All those promises. Today I want to talk about two promises. One that our Jewish friends saw fulfilled some decades ago, and another that they have missed, but has also been fulfilled. Now having said all of that, would you please stand for a moment of learning together, and we will address this question. What did the Apostle Paul say about the promises of God? And I'll read it first in his letter to the second letter to the church in Corinth. He said, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. I like that thought. They all reduce to one thing, Christ. So here's the question. What did the Apostle Paul say about the promises of God? Together, please. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Thank you. Pastor Larson, would you bring us the text? Pastor's message today is entitled, The Promise of Christmas. It's taken from two texts, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, and Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. I will be reading the Luke chapter 1 portion. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who, who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
Lord Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The scriptures promise that God would send a shepherd for his sheep. This is not a great compliment, by the way. Sheep are the dumbest of all animals. But we do need a shepherd, don't we? And that little video that our team came up with, that Kayla came up with, shows us some shepherds working on the hillside there in the West Bank in Palestine. You may think, what's that got to do with where we're going? Well, just this. How would you like to be a shepherd? What about a bunch of teenage boys years ago who were sent by their fathers and uncles to shepherd a flock and had a most miraculous and extraordinary experience some 70 years ago. I'll come back to that. What would you do if you're a shepherd boy out there? I imagine it would be rather hot and dusty and boring unless you like hanging around with sheep. What would you do? And so they invented a game and they found something extraordinary coming from that game. And we'll talk about that in just a little while. First, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies and all of your kindness. We pray that our hearts will be warmed by the gospel and that if there's anyone here this morning who has not yet come to the realization that Jesus is who he said he is, we pray that heart would be opened, that mind would be made clear, that you'd have mercy upon me. And when I say something not helpful in your sight, I pray you would bring it to nothing and quickly. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray, amen. The promise of Christmas, I think where we live and how we have lived in this beautiful place as Americans, typically middle and upper middle class Americans, Christmas is just plain a good time. It's better to give than to receive, but there's a lot of fun to be had in receiving, isn't there? And we all know it. I remember I had this friend named David. Every year he wrote this long letter to Santa Claus. Well, in my house we didn't teach Santa Claus, so I felt really bummed by that, so I sent a letter to my mom. Now I'm sending it to Pastor Larson. Looking for stuff. What kind of stuff? I remember I had an atheist professor in college who said one day as an aside that he was going to buy his Christmas tree. And we said, well, professor, whatever his name was, a Christmas tree? He, we thought you're an atheist. I am an atheist. He said, but Christmas is just fun. Why would you not celebrate Christmas? Actually, Christmas is a whole lot more than fun. Christmas is the celebration of the fulfillment of some most extraordinary promises made by God. It was overlooked probably last week in the busyness of the world we're living in, with the sexual predation being on every headline, with the guy in North Korea threatening to blow up the world, with all that is happening and all that is disappointing and violent, something was overlooked. It's an event that happened 70 years ago, last Tuesday, the United Nations officially and legally created the nation states in the Palestinian peninsula, in that whole area, for both the Arabs and the Jews. Now, it is true that Israel was founded as a nation in 1948, but they had nowhere to live. It was 50 years ago, last Tuesday, that the UN ruled that they can each have a portion of that real estate, and of course they were fighting ever since. That was the 70th anniversary of the fulfillment of a promise to the Jews. We may say, well, if the Jews don't believe in their Messiah, would God really bless them? Yes, he would. I did not say unto salvation. There is no salvation outside of Christ. But because God is a promise-keeping God, he is good and he keeps his promises. And he made a promise to the people of Abraham, I will restore your, you to your land. And he keeps his promises. You can go over there to Israel, I am told now, and find very few believers who know their Messiah. But they did get back their land. The promise was kept. How did that happen? Well, Israel broke covenant with God back in those centuries before the coming of the Christ. I mean by that. They became idolatrous. They became a people who worshipped false gods. They displeased God, and so he told them, I will scatter you among the nations, and I will draw you out of my sword, and I will draw out my sword and pursue you. And your land will be laid waste, and your cities will lie in ruins. And he did exactly that. And for many centuries, the Jews were a wandering people around planet Earth. Even their language basically receded and was virtually unheard of. God scattered them. But God kept another promise that he had made to them. We find one version of it in Deuteronomy where God said, Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. Now some people say, yes, that's what happened with Ezra and Nehemiah when they came back after the captivity. That's true, but it's not entirely true. The ultimate promise was to bring them back and create their own nation that would be independent, and that's what we're seeing now. 
Jeremiah the prophet said, The time is coming, though, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is part B of that same promise. God said, I'll give you back your land and I'll draw you back, but I'm going to do something even greater than that. I'm going to make a new covenant. And Israel will become those who belong to the Son of God, Jesus. True Israel right now, real Israel is, are the people of Christ, Jews and Gentiles. And the new covenant that was promised is different. It will not be like the one I made to their forefathers, characterized by a million rules. It will be, they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So that was God's promise. I'll give you back the land and eventually I'll create a new covenant and you're supposed to be watching for both if you are a child of Abraham. It is safe to say that the vast majority of our Jewish friends rejoice over the land, but they're missing the second part of the promise. That promise that was so important. The promise of a young woman. Now that promise was given at the same time as the land promise. Isaiah said this. This is 700 years before Mary heard from the angel. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with a child. She will give birth to his son, and you will call him Emmanuel. In other words, God will come upon this young woman and bring about in her a conception of a human being. But he will be born without a sin nature, because the Holy Spirit has no sin. If Mary had had a human husband, father, the child Jesus, Jesus would have been born with a sin nature, would have fallen into sin, and could never be our Redeemer. Okay, I've said a lot of things up here. Let's review. God made a promise to Israel he'd scatter them. Then he promised them eventually, when they had time to repent, he'd bring them back. And then he promised them their own land. They have that. In the middle of those promises, integrated into those promises, was the promise that in any case, Israel, I'm going to make a new covenant, and I'll come to be among you. God will live among you. That's the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that was hard for them to discern. It is one thing for God to say to the people of Abraham, I'll give you a land, you'll be able to locate it. Here's its longitude, latitude, it's on the map. And you look over there at the Middle East and you see the division of nations and there is some land and it says Israel on it. That's not hard to discern, but how would anyone discern the second part of the promise, the Christ who will come to live among you? I mean, even the people, even the people in Jesus' day weren't sure quite how would they know if it was him much less now. We have Jews somewhat in our family, lots of friends went to college in New York or New York area by upbringing, so I know lots of Jewish kids. My roommate at Rutgers was a Jewish kid. Love these people. But they don't want to talk about Jesus. But, but, but they weren't sure what to make of Jesus, and they certainly weren't sure what to make of Jesus in the first century. So, Jesus revealed himself to a guy named Philip. It says here, maybe we just went back 20 centuries, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And he found a guy named Philip and he said to him, follow me. And he did it. I mean, what did he know about Jesus? We're not sure. But he did it. He followed him. We saw that earlier. People leave their nets, they leave their boats, they leave their father and their mother, they just start following Jesus. The divine magic settles in. It's Jesus, I want to follow him. And boy, when you come out of atheism and learn to follow Jesus, you can relate to this. There's something about Jesus. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And so they're all excited. And so Philip went and found his friend Nathaniel. And he said to him, listen, we found the Messiah. We found the one Moses wrote about in the law. About whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said, huh? Nazareth. Are you kidding, Philip? Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? You see, they're not sure what to expect about the Messiah. Basically, they're expecting a great warrior who would deliver them from the Romans, or at least somebody pulling up with a series of limousines and flashing lights and motorcycles up to the Trump Tower or something. Nazareth. It'd be like saying, he, he's got bearing, and he's got dignity, and he's got class, and he's got credentials, and he's, he's marvelous to behold, and he comes from Flint. <laughs> Sorry, you Flint people. 
He comes from inner city Detroit. He comes from Chicago, where last weekend 10 more people were shot in violent episodes. They can't come from there. Those aren't any credentials that we can embrace. What are you talking about, Philip? <laughs> have you ever had a, and you have, I'm sure, had an instance where you're telling someone about your faith in Christ, your certainty that he is real, and they're looking at you like you just got here from Mars? Maybe even somewhere further than that, right? Right? Jake, you with me? I mean, what are you talking about? And you realize that no matter how persuasive you feel you're being and how sincere, they just don't get it. Why? Why? Why is it so hard to get? Well, it is hard to get. It's the craziest thing anybody ever said. Think about that. That God became a man, took on flesh, lived without sin, went on the cross, was crucified, put in the ground, three days later he was resurrected. You, you believe that? I mean, that is some story, if you think about it. Oh, I believe it. But it is pretty amazing. What do they have to have? What do they need for that promise to make sense? They need to experience him for themselves. Right, Donald? Let me have some fun with you for a second. Have any of you, do any of you have memories of going to 125 West Saddle River Road in Saddle River, New Jersey. Anybody been there? My sister's out there, don't you answer. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Bill? You could say to me, I don't believe there's such a place. I don't even see it when I Google it on the big map. That's about half an hour outside of New York City. That's the house I grew up in. Beautiful little old colonial house on about five or six acres, those funny windows that look wavy because of the originals. You've never been there. What if it was important to me, it's not, to convince you that that place exists? How would I do it, Char? I'd take you there, Sharon, and you'd see, see he's right, it exists. That's how it works, right? I did that in the first service, and Andy Warner, who grew up about a mile away in Ridgewood, said, oh, I know where that is. I said, sit down. <laughs> That's not much help. The point is, you have to, have to hope and pray that the person will experience Christ for themselves. Someone say amen. So what do you think Philip said to Nathaniel? He told Nathaniel, he said, well, we found the one. He's from Flint, right? We found the one. He's from Nazareth. And there's Nathaniel saying, oh, you've got to be kidding. So what did Philip do? He said, come and see. That was a great response. I can't talk you into this, Nathaniel, but come with me. You'll, you'll see this. Well, it's amazing because Jesus sees Nathaniel coming and he says, Oh, there's, uh, I know that guy. And Philip and Nathaniel walk all the way over to Jesus. They've been 500 yards away. How do you know me? I saw you under the tree. Oh, this is amazing. You must be the Christ. <laughs> you think I'm the Christ because I saw you under the tree, he said? You'll see greater things than that. Another promise. Jesus revealed the secret of the kingdom of God. I want to digress just a blink to remind you again and myself with you. If you belong to Christ, he did it, not you. That's such hard theology these days. It is so unwelcome. We're hearing a distorted gospel a lot of the time in a lot of places by well-meaning preachers. Give yourself over. Don't resist him anymore. It's up to you. It's up to you. Make your decision. Eh, yeah, well, if you make the right decision, it's because of him, because... Jesus told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given unto you. And then Jesus said, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows who the Father is except the Son. Did you hear that? This is a secret. It's mysterion is the Greek word. And no one, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal them that I'm a born again man is because Jesus acted upon my spirit. Can someone say amen? Steve, can you relate to that, Steve? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be here for all the tea in China if he hadn't moved on your heart. I got you in, by the way. <laughs> That's totally untrue. Isn't it a glorious thing to contemplate that this promise of salvation was given, but it's a bit of a mystery? Okay, so we were talking a little while ago about this November the 29th, last Tuesday. That was the date when the decision was made to give Israel their own land. And our Jewish friends, we need to pray for our Jewish friends and family, rejoiced over that. Now, I understand. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad of it. Not been there yet myself, but maybe we'll get there. It's okay. It's not important to me to see that real estate, but many Christians are blessed in the going. 
But there was another promise out there that was also reminded and revealed not long after that. Actually, a few months before this event, November of 67, some boys were herding sheep. That's a picture of a typical cave on the West Bank in the area of Palestine. You remember, Palestine is the modern word for Philistine. And so all of those peoples that have been warring forever, they're still warring. That's what that is, the, the Philistine area, the Palestinian strip there. Well, that's a cave. And these boys, Mohammed, Huma, and Khalib, were bored, no doubt, tending their uncle's flocks, I guess. And they began scaling rocks the way kids would do. I love doing that, still do it. And you ever get by a pond with a bunch of kids? That's a fun game. And they're scaling rocks, and they're scaling them into the mouth of the cave when they suddenly hear a crashing sound. It sounded just like ceramic being broken, and it was ceramic being broken, because when they went in, they found the first of many vases filled with manuscripts, and they turned out to be what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those documents fulfill the promise of God. Remember, I said there were two key promises. The first was for land. The second was for the Son of God. If you go after church over to Barnes & Noble or one of the stores and buy a modern Bible, you will open it if you want to. You can open it to Isaiah chapter 7, and it will read exactly that way. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. That's the great Christmas promise. That's the meaning of this morning's message. The point is that that manuscript, 2,700 years old, found in that cave, reads virtually exactly the same way. When you meet someone who says, how can you trust the Bible? A bunch of old papers, a lot of old dead guys wrote years ago. Amazing. There are no other documents from antiquity that have been studied with the zeal brought to the study of the Word of God. Those documents are so accurate, they were so careful, that when the kids found those, within a few days the experts opened up to Isaiah and realized it was letter perfect. Fulfillment of the promise. And here's the other part of that promise. It's given to us who belong to Christ that we will dine together. I think that's exciting. Can you imagine? How could God do that? How could he call us to his table in the great renewal of the kingdom with all the other believers, some banquet hall? Jesus, we pray that we will embrace in our hearts this promise. that God will be with us, Emmanuel, living without sin, calling us to himself, and that is you, Jesus. If anybody's here this morning, you've never said, Jesus, come into my life, I need to know you. I need to have your mercies flow freely in my life, take away my sin, give me the new life, I want to come to that great feast. This is a great day to do that, say, Jesus, save me. And Lord Jesus, thank you for the land that our Jewish friends have. But we pray the second and greater promise would be made known to them, that you are the Son of God, that you alone can save, that there is a kingdom unseen here and now that will eventually eclipse and gobble up the world as we know it, a place without sin and suffering, a place where no one is violating anyone else's dignity, a place where violence is unheard of, a place where threats to shoot and kill and abuse are simply unthinkable. In Jesus, we embrace the Christmas promise that is you, and we sing to you now in your name. Amen.